Right, we're going to talk about an alternative lifestyle now because all we've basically done so far is to look at everything that's bad. And uh, like my friend said to me, I've listened to all your lectures, I now drink water and breathe fresh air, how long do I have to live? <laughs> or like my friend in the back there said, he closes his eyes and he says to the Lord, Lord remove everything from my plate that's bad for me and now he's scared there's going to be nothing left when he opens his eyes again. <laughs> well is there still something to eat or is there nothing to eat? That is the question we'll have to start looking at. Remember we spoke about per capita meat consumption and how it affects your uh, lifestyle and your health, colon, cancer incidence, obviously we saw that animal products are problematic. They are correlated to cancer and we looked at animal husbandry, we looked at osteoporosis and what effect it has and uh, all these issues. I perhaps would like to share just one little experiment that we did as well because sheep were developing skew legs we decided to have a look at uh, what the effect of the diet is that they were feeding these animals as to why they were getting skew legs. There's a sheep with slightly skew legs and there's one that can hardly walk from the skew legs that it has. And when we analyzed their bones, those that had received animal protein had a low calcium to phosphorus ratio in the bone. So they had a decline in the various bones, the vertebrae, the ribs, and the cannon, in all three of them, the more animal protein one added to the diet. And these days they feed these animals fish meal, carcass meal, bone meal, all of these things. When we compared those that received animal protein versus plant protein, the calcium loss, as you see there again in the sheep, was three times as great. Deformity in those that got animal protein was much higher than those that received plant protein and calcium to phosphorus ratios in the bone were very low when they received animal protein. And generally speaking, this is what we found if we look at this little graph over here. We found that if we got, gave them plant protein only at a 12% level, they had very good bone development if we added 3%, 5%, 8% animal protein, it got worse and worse. But if we added 8% plant protein, it actually improved. So plant protein definitely is the way to have a healthy system. We also spoke in the lectures about fear in the food chain and how animal products today are not what they were in the past because there are bacterial resistances which are very high, reaching up to 100% levels in many, many cases. That means that bacteria don't work, uh, are not affected by the antibiotics at all. We also compared animal products compared to plant products in terms of toxic levels and how toxins are increased up the food chain, giving us many reasons why we should avoid these products. Remember we looked at fish oils, and saw that they were just as high in cholesterol as the others and that uh, plant foods could give you the omega-3 fatty acids like the avocado and especially also the nuts and the seed items uh, could give you everything that you required. And these are often arguments which are used as to why one should not become a vegetarian. Where would you get you this? Where would you get you that? Plants give you everything, provided you have a variety in your diet. Of course, if you're going to eat lettuce, leaves and carrots, sprigs, then you're going to have a problem. So one has to make wise decisions when one changes one's lifestyle. And if one wants to avoid all the potential hazards in the animal husbandry industry, can plants replace meat? The answer is yes, they can. But you have to be wise and circumspect in what you are doing. And the bottom of the food chain should look like this um, from now on. Active lifestyles, long lifestyles, those are the things that we want. Longevity. The Hunzas, for example, were famous for their longevity 
and their almost total lack of degenerative diseases. And why? Because they had lifestyles which were largely vegan, vegetarian, active, walking up and down. There are many aspects which uh, confirm that a vegetarian diet is healthier. Even the tabloids today will say vegetarians live longer and also are considerably healthier. For example, if you want to do maximum endurance tests, you will find that uh, those on a high meat diet have a, the lowest endurance for sustained maximum to exhaustion exercise. Mixed diets, that means lower meat, fat and protein diets, were sort of midway, and the vegetarian diets, high carbohydrate diets, gave the highest endurance rate more than double that of the other groupings. So science and sports science today has contributed a lot to the breakdown of prejudice against uh, diets. And there were some very important people who were vegetarians. Albert Einstein was a vegetarian. George Bernard Shaw was a vegetarian. Wilhelm Busch. Uh, the McCartneys were. But uh, Linda McCartney died at a very early age, although she was a vegetarian. And people say, well, what's the problem over here? We'll just get hold of one of her recipe books and see what she did. Everything she did was fried in oil. Everything. Now we looked at the carcinogenic effects of that. And so there are issues that you have to look at. You can't just say, I'm going to give up eating uh, animal products. I'm going to switch to plant products. And then you prepare everything in an unhealthy way you're going to have a problem. So we have to be circumspect. And of course, there is nothing that can guarantee a disease-free life. It can just give you a greater probability of a disease-free life. And uh, just to show you that beautiful women can also be vegetarian. Both Whitney Houston and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer were vegetarian. Also endurance and marathon running and sporting activities, all of these are enhanced by vegetarian diets. Blood pressure. Vegetarians have considerably lower blood pressure than non-vegetarians. And these are lacto-vegetarians over here, lacto-over-vegetarians. If we put a vegan down here, the blood pressures are still lower. In fact, most vegans, when they go to the doctor to have their blood pressure taken, they say, excuse me, are you still alive? because the blood pressures are very, very low. And uh, that is not a, good, a bad thing at all, provided you're not dizzy. That simply means that your blood vessels are still supple and, and flexible and don't need one high pressure to pump the blood through there. They're not constricted. And then if you're going to buy food in environments that are not so sanitary, like this one over here, where would you prefer to buy? What would you prefer to buy? The vegetables from this man? Or would you prefer to buy chickens or meat in a circumstance that looks like this with the flies buzzing around? Well, even in the worst of circumstances, you're still going to be safer with the vegetable products than with the others. And you don't know what these things have been eating and what they have been fed. Now, what about the vegan vegetarian lifestyle? Isn't that a dangerous lifestyle? And isn't it a fact that if you become a vegetarian, you should look, look something like this? Most people have an idea of a vegan, vegan vegetarian as a thin little pale little individual, hardly capable of moving. That's, what the, that's the sort of idea that they have of these people. And let's face it, some of them are like that. And uh, the reason why is because they've thrown everything off their plate and substituted it with nothing. And then they become something like this. And uh, it is a sad state of affairs. American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, vegans, vegetarians, whole food omnivores had adequate intakes of most nutrients and were exemplars of balance, variety, moderation in comparisons with omnivores in their sample and the general population. Also, they were more in line with current dietary recommendations for nutritional intakes than were omnivorous diets. So when they actually compared the diets according to the recommended daily food intakes, the vegetarians weren't doing so badly at all. In fact, they were doing better than the omnivores. 
Now, they will tell you it's not safe to be a vegetarian because you'll have iron problems, B12 problems, vitamin D problems, etc., etc. Is this really so? Iron problems, you will have a greater probability of iron problems if you use dairy products because of the uh, parameters that we discussed in that lecture. Uh, B12 is the one issue we will have to discuss. Vitamin D will be a problem only in areas where there is constant cloud cover. And even there you have UV coming through, so if you have exposure to the sun, you should be fine. You need uh, exposure, but people today want to sit inside all the time. Here are stomach bacteria with decreasing gastric pH. Notice that the lower the pH, the fewer bacteria. The higher the pH, the more bacteria. The same in the intestine. The lower the pH, and so from the front to the back, where the acid starts coming in, you have an increase in the number of bacteria. Now B12 is not produced by any animal in the world. It's produced by bacteria. And there are certain bacteria which in our intestines are quite capable of producing B12. Unfortunately, with the lifestyles that people have, these bacteria only occur here where there's an increase. And uh, they occur in the last part of the intestine. And so they're too far back for us to benefit from them. So we produce the B12, but we do not absorb it. If, however, we were vegans and we took care not to mix fruits and vegetables, firstly, we would have an alkaline saliva and we would have bacteria in the mouth which would produce B12. And they don't produce bad odors. Bad odors come from poor fermenta or fermentation in the stomach. So you would have B12 production in the mouth, plus the pH in the stomach would seldom, if ever, go below 4.5, so you're sitting with uh, far less acidity. That means you're starting off here at a much higher level, and then you should be able to have B12 production. Now, there are other factors which affect B12. That's intrinsic factor. If you don't have that, whether you're a vegetarian or not, you're going to have a trouble with that. High acidity, which is more problematic for meat eaters than for vegetarians, would be a problem. And in fact, most of the world's population is largely vegetarian. A whole parts of India, large parts of Asia, Central Asia, Asia, for example, Central African populations, large parts of these, they don't have B12 problems. Western lifestyles, we sometimes do have B12 problems. So personally, I think that they are making a mountain out of a molehill, but I would suggest that if you are worried about these issues, if you have a high stress lifestyle, which affects absorption in an acid environment of B12, well then take a supplement or take a fortified milk that has B12 supplementation. But generally speaking, uh, we do have the bacteria that produce the B12. So my suggestion, as I said again, is supplement if you have a high stress lifestyle and all of these or, const or otherwise test yourself regularly. Once a year, have a test because B12 is maintained in the body for a long, long time, many years, and you won't run out overnight. So if you have a regular tests done once a year or so, and you're fine, then you have nothing to worry about. If it's low, well then take a supplement. And the same would apply to people that eat meat. They are just in as great a danger. In fact, more of them suffer from B12 deficiency than anyone else. Uh, if we look at minerals, we need all these minerals. Calcium, potassium, iron, manganese, fluorine, selenium, tin, phosphorus. There's a whole host of minerals that we need and you will find that they find, have all these different functions. They're in bone, act for alkalinity, blood, they're antioxidants, they're for thyroid function, enzyme functions, you name it. And vitamins and minerals have to interact with each other. So if you want to have good activity of vitamin E, you'll have to have selenium and zinc and calcium and all of these have to be together in the body. And 
vitamins also interact with each other, so you don't want to take selective vitamins. You want to have everything in a balanced format. And the, the minerals interact with each other, and no, no one mineral is an island and independent of each other. And here's a major problem in the world today. You see, plant foods can produce vitamins, sometimes if they're not mineral dependent, just by photosynthesis. But where do plants actually get their minerals from? They get them from the soil. Now what if the soil in an area is depleted? What do you do then? Well then you have mineral poor plants. And if a plant is mineral poor, then it has the problem that it doesn't fight infection so well. It's very prone to uh, pests coming and uh, taking advantage of the situation. And so the problem is that they start spraying these plants more and more and more. And most farmers only substitute their ground with about five or six minerals. They don't take care of all the minerals. We need all the minerals. So the very best thing that mankind could do is to reintroduce organic farming, where they make sure that their soil has every single mineral required for growth. That means you start using rock phosphates and calcitic limes and things like that, which have every mineral under the sun as your basis and start producing plants like that. Now that's a little bit more expensive than the other fertilizers, but the rewards would be tremendous. That's one issue. If you're living in an environment and these plants are too expensive and you don't even know whether they're doing it right or not, then I suggest you get foods from a variety of places. And then there's one other thing I would like to talk about while we're busy with minerals, and that is salt. The scientific world tells you that you should not use salt at all in your cooking because it produces high blood pressure and it, uh, it's bad for you and what have you. And people develop all kinds of diseases. And if you really, really run down and really, really sick and you have money to, to burn, then the Europeans in particular, they like going to these cure places where you have the hot springs with the uh, mineral rich waters and the salt waters. And they go and lie in the salts and they drink this water that comes out of the, and they feel like a million bucks and their blood pressure comes down and everything is right. So they're using a salt cure to solve their problem. Then they go back to their normal society and their normal lifestyle and very shortly they have the same stress and the same blood pressure problems and the this and the that and the other. Now, I have a problem here. How come the salt can actually cure some of these things and the salt cause the things at the same time? Does it make sense? It doesn't really make much sense if you think about it in those terms. Now, what is the main salt that is used in the world today? It's sodium chloride. Now salt should have 84 minerals. Rocks out there, sea, has the salt in the sea contains 84 minerals. And the fish and the animals in the sea without pollutants now are perfectly happy and have lived there for thousands of years quite happily reproducing and not being diseased although there's a lot of salt in that water. But it is 84 mineral salt. Now, unfortunately today, when they harvest the salt, what they do, industry has so many requirements for various catalysts and various elements that they refine the salt and they take all those elements out. And eventually they leave you with two elements, sodium and chloride. If they could refine them, they would do that as well and sell you only the sodium and only the chloride. But unfortunately, the sodium would explode and the chloride would kill you. So they at least sell you the sodium chloride, two elements out of the 84. And then occasionally they have a twinge of conscience and they add one more, which is that, iodine. <laughs> and they tell you, best to buy iodized salts. And now you start cooking with two elements. Just do a simple test. Take sea salt, which has 84 elements, and put it on your tongue, and just rub it around there. 
and see how long you last. You'll last for a long time. Eventually it actually tastes quite pleasant. And then you take normal table salt, sodium chloride, and you put that on your tongue and you see how long you last. And you'll see it'll burn your tongue like crazy and you won't be able to handle it. And it'll have this sharp taste. So my suggestion is when you start using a little bit of salt, because without salt everything tastes kind of bland, doesn't it? Use sea salt. Why not use sea salt? Or better still, if you can, rock salt. In some areas you get rock salt cheaply, but sea salt would be just fine. They use sea salt in any case. A good suggestion would be to use a little bit of sea salt. You know what? It'll taste better as well once you get used to it. It tastes a lot better. And of course, don't use excessive amounts of salt, but generally just use a little and it'll be so much tastier. Zinc, they'll tell you that's a problem for vegetarians. That's not true. If you look at beans, for example, they have relatively high levels of uh, zinc in them. And some grains, popcorn even has, uh, popcorn is one of the highest so sources of zinc, uh, generally speaking. Uh, wheat germ has high levels of zinc and wheat bran. So that is not true that uh, vegetarian diets won't provide enough zinc. So generally speaking, if you have foods that are yellow, then you will have your vitamin A's and if you have your grains and your nuts and your legumes in there, you should be getting everything that you require. Uh, increase in dietary needs during pregnancy, you need a lot of folic acid, folicin you need, you need a little bit more protein, and one, all of these, if, can a vegetarian diet supply these? Of course. Seeds, avocados, nuts uh, will supply all the folic acid that you require. Now just a couple of general guidelines. Number one, you have to eat an abundance of fruits, grains, nuts, seeds, legumes and vegetables. You cannot just remove the heavy foods and sit with only fruits or only vegetables. You have to have grains, varieties of grains, varieties of nuts, seeds, legumes in your diet and you don't have to eat them as such. You can work with them and change them and modify them. You have to eat more alkaline forming foods than acid forming foods. That happens automatically when you become vegetarian and avoid acid formation by choosing correct food combinations. Three simple criteria, two, two of which uh, you have to watch, one which comes automatically. Now, if you read some health books, they have so many complex things that you have to do that you have to buy yourself a computer just to, you know, start working out what you must do in the kitchen. And eventually you go totally nuts. And there are so many rules and regulations as to what you must eat that you might as well just forget it. I don't know whether you've heard all of these things. I know there's so many of them. You're not allowed to eat what grows above the ground with what grows below the ground. You're not allowed to mix proteins and carbohydrates at the same meal. Have you heard all of those before? I mean, there are really silly ideas out there. Then how did God make grain? Grain consists of protein and carbohydrates. How do you make legumes? Consists of proteins and carbohydrates. Every food consists of proteins and carbohydrates. It's, it's a silly idea. The problem is not the protein and the carbohydrate together. The problem is the animal protein and the carbohydrate together. Does that make sense? Because the plant protein digests quickly. So if you don't have animal proteins in your diet, then all of the problems associated with the so-called mixing of protein and carbohydrate disappear. So you want a diet rich in carbohydrates and not like many recommend low carbohydrate. You want to burn your body with a clean burning fuel. You want to have enough fats in your diet so that you do not, do not become lean and emaciated on the one hand. And of course you need the fatty acids, the essential fatty acids which you can only get in fats. So you get those if you have your seeds and your nuts and your legumes in your diet. And your proteins, you satisfy 
your general needs, kids a little bit more than the adults, and you want to have more alkaline forming foods than acid forming foods. How do you do that? It's very simple. The high acid foods are the meats. Bacon, beef, chicken, crabs, eggs, fish, ham, those are the high uh, acid forming foods with 15 to 40 percent acid formation. Medium is grains, legumes, lentils, oats, peanuts, rye, wheat, some nuts, etc. And the low, some fruits, cranberries and plums. That doesn't mean you mustn't eat them. Not at all because they're so low acid forming it doesn't make any difference. And some of the fats and your high alkalines are your, all your dried fruits, uh, vegetables, well molasses is on there because it's alkaline forming but it's still a more refined food. Beet green, Swiss chard, dandelion, those are your high alkaline foods. Your medium ones are most fruits and vegetables. And some legumes are actually alkaline forming. Particularly if you're now old and you have a little bit of arthritis problems and things like that already, then it's good to in, uh, introduce things like lima beans, navy beans, peas generally, chickpeas, all of those, nuts. The only alkaline nuts are almonds, chestnuts and coconuts. So almond is a very good nut. And then you have some grains that are alkaline like millet. Millet is an excellent grain. We'll talk about that in a moment. Sorghum. And then of course your kidney beans, snap beans, soybeans, all of this is alkaline forming. This is excellent food. So once you cut out the animal products, you don't even have to worry about acid alkaline diets. By the way, it's the minerals that are acid uh, producing more than anything else. So your alkaline minerals are bound in fruits and vegetables. Now, here's a typical suggestion. They say you must have legumes, nuts, seeds, including nut butters. You can use uh, fortified soys or soy milks, uh, vegetables, fruits, grains and bread. And if you get enough of those in the diet, you should be fine. And when it comes to young children, the only thing that changes is the proportion. So you want to have cereals uh, in the diet, you want to have fruits pureed, but when it comes to, the, to the, the energy foods, you want more of those in children's foods than in the others. So cereals, fruits, protein foods, green leafy or yellow vegetables will supply every single requirement that you need. And you can see that all of it is being met or 99 percent with just a very moderate uh, intake. Some useful equipment that you need. A good blender is very useful in vegetarian cooking because you're going to start making nut creams and nut butters and and uh, milks and sauces and things like that and uh, cheese substitutes and all kinds of things. So a good blender is a very, very good investment. Now when I talk about a good blender, I mean that one, one that has a powerful engine and one that will really spin. Because if you buy a weak one, it won't do the job. It will irritate you. It will chop the things around and you'll have gritsy pieces in your mouth when you want a fine cream, for example. It will be most unsatisfactory. So rather invest in a good blender. A heavy base or non-stick frying pan, uh, waterless cookware might be quite good and some people like extras like waffle irons, food processors and if you're really going uh, all out, some means to uh, grind your own flour. That's just nice. If you have access to stone ground flour, well then you don't have to get those pieces of equipment. Stone ground flour is a terrific way to go. Ensuring proper combinations. Notice that there are some foods that are neutral. That is all grains, all legumes, all nuts, all seeds, some vegetables like those that are high in water like cucumber, lettuce, sprouts, tomatoes, some people yes, some people no, and the herb, herby plants. Those would be sort of neutral and some fruits would be neutral, the high oil ones, avocados and olives. Then the fruits is anything else that is a fruit like an apple, an apricot, banana and what have you. All of these 
can be eaten together with this. So you can have a meal which contains a grain. Let's say bread, a roll. And you could have a patty on there which is made of legumes and nuts. And you can have lettuce on there and sprouts on there and tomato on there. And you can have a sauce on there which you make with seeds or nuts combinations. You can have avocados as a butter and olives in there and eat it with all that fruit. So you can have a terrific meal with a table full of fruit and bread and spreads and all kinds of stuff and patties, but you don't mix your vegetables in in there. So if you want to have a meal with vegetables, then the vegetables are also compatible with any one of those. But the vegetable and the fruit together, they're a problem. Well, that's a very interesting thing. You see, the fruit digests the fastest. These, if they are all of plant origin, digest second fastest. And the vegetables, which have hard, compact cell walls, digest the slowest. So if you mix these two, you will actually get fermentation. Whereas if you mix those two, you don't get fermentation. Mixing fruits and vegetables, no fermentation. The time is not a long enough difference for fermentation. Mix vegetables and the grains and legumes and nuts, etc. Time is not long enough for fermentation. Mix the two together, you have a problem. So that is just to keep a nice alkaline system. It makes a big difference in terms of, for example, hmm, acidity and also just alertness. Uh, it's not a law of Medes and Persians and if, if you are a guest somewhere or you do not have the possibility of always doing this, then it's no big deal. If I do it, for example, I'm quite sensitive to, us because, to this because I actually take care not to do it. If I do it on occasion, I feel the difference. I feel I have less energy. So these are sort of the neutrals that you can eat with any category of food, with fruits, or with vegetables, whatever. Grain legume combination is always a good combination because of the protein. It gives you a perfect protein. So a diet that contains grains, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables will supply a superb blend of nutrients. And the African diet, as we said, is legumes and grains, and that is their protein source. Then they have lots of vegetables, and lots of fruit. And now let's talk about whole foods. What is the power of a whole food plant? Number one, it exceeds that of their component parts. So if you take the things apart and you eat them separately, like in refined foods you would have to do that, you do not have this enhancement that you get in the whole food plant. Secondly, one cup of cooked kale has 50 milligrams of vitamin C and 13 international units of vitamin E. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. The antioxidant potential of one cup of kale is equal, however, because of the other components, to 800 milligrams of vitamin C and 1,100 units of vitamin E. So you could be looking at 13 and say that's pathetic, but because of the other components which boost it, it's actually that much. And the balance is so much better. So it's far better to eat a whole food than to eat anything separate. Refined foods, avoid them. Now, you know, everybody occasionally gets sick of healthful eating. I do. You know, you eat healthy food every day, I'm sick of all this healthy food. I feel like something wicked today. <laughs> well, then you go out and you eat something wicked within certain parameters, if you know what I mean. You don't go and slaughter an ox now. But a refined food occasionally, who cares? Or a, you know, something really sweet and disgusting, who cares? As long as that's not your lifestyle. Don't become fanatical about food because you'll only, not only make yourself but everyone around you miserable. And try never to see what other people eat. It's not your business. What you eat is your business. And what they eat is their business. Set a nice example and people will like to follow it. Don't refine it if you can use it. Now what does that mean? 
How do you think whole foods? What do you do? What do you do if you find a pile of nuts and seeds and stuff like that? So you go clonk, 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 put it on your plate and say, there. You want to be a whole food fanatic? Go and eat it. No. You must learn what to do with them. You must change these things. These are whole foods. Those are whole foods. And variety, variety, variety is the spice of life. By the way, eating breakfast saves lives possible reducing the risk of a heart attack if you have a problem during the day and uh, clot potential those people who are breakfast skippers have a 2.5 greater probability in other words 2.5 times the the risk category to this person that eats normally and has breakfast so two to three hours of the awakening if you had breakfast you are better off than if you do not have it. The advantages of eating breakfast is more efficient problem solving, improved memory, improved uh, verbal fluency, attention span, better attitudes, better scholastic performance, and uh, that's a good reason why you should have breakfast. These are all the nice whole foods you can find in some stores. Now, now let's think about what to do with specific foods. For example, grains. You are now thrown out a lot of things. You've thrown out dairy, you've thrown out meat, you've thrown out all of those things. Now, what to replace them with? Now you have to start thinking grains. You know, if we were to take the grains in the world and put them into tiny little packets, just like this. We did this once in South Africa. We went to a seed store and we bought all the different edible grains and put them into tiny packets and we packed them around the hall from one side all the way around, right around, and said to the people, you go and look at all those grains. And they were stunned. All the grains that you can buy, all the sorghums and the various wheat types and the, and the, the eastern grains and the millets and all these wonderful things, just hundreds of different grains. So there's barley, for example, which is a rich mineral food and is rich in B5 vitamin. So if you have B5, that promotes fat metabolism. So if it's cold, if it's winter, for example, just a touch of barley in something, in a stew, or a little bit of barley mixed in with rice that you're cooking, and you have a better heat production. Uh, maize, for example, is an excellent food. These are all the different grains that you have to start thinking about and what you can do with them. Millet is a fantastic grain. It's a wonder food. It's China's oldest grain. It can replace eggs in all patties, pancakes. Millet patties are fantastic. Just fry a little bit of onions. You don't even have to use oil to fry onions. You can just use a dash of water and a dash of something uh, to make it uh, a little bit flavored. Uh, whatever it is, soy sauce or whatever. And then just saute them until they go brown and sticky and keep turning them around and add that to a patty with cooked millet and uh, a little bit of uh, oats to bind it and you have a wonderful patty. It replaces eggs. It's very high in iron. It's high in vitamin E and the great thing about it, it's an alkaline grain. So people, older people in particular, people that already have, uh, you know, joint pains or anything like that could benefit tremendously from this. And what is, what is even better, it's a complete protein. So for children, it's a wonderful grain. Protects against arthritis. It's one of the alkaline grains. It's high in lecithin. It's a complete protein. Add it to bread, cookies, muesli, soups, casseroles, whatever. You can do marvelous things with millet. Just cook a little bit of millet. You want to make a spread? Cook together until soft, just like you would cook rice. You know, one cup millet, two and a half cups water. So you take the millet, buy, make sure you buy dehusked millet. You know, millet is bird seeds. You know how birds live and how long they live just off millet, nothing else? They do very well on millet, so we could do well on millet. But we don't have beaks. We have teeth. And birds dehusk the millet and then the, the husks lie down or the, the there. If you bought it husk, you would have a chewing experience par excellence. <laughs> so just like any other grain, you have to buy it dehusked. A little bit of salt, good salt. 
Uh, you can put something to make it yellow. You could just, for example, use a little bit of turmeric. If you don't want to use turmeric, use a tip of a, of, a, of a carrot and blend it in there, then it goes yellow. And some water and you blend till smooth and then it looks like that. Looks like a butter. And you're going to have bread with millet spread. It's rather neutral, so you could put something sweet on there. You could put something savory on there. You could do whatever you like. With millet, you can make a fantastic pudding. Notice how smooth and creamy it looks once you've put it in a blender. So you put this cooked millet in a blender and you make it absolute smooth and creamy. Then you can make a pudding out of that that is fantastic. So you can blend in some dates, for example. You could blend in a little bit of carob powder, then you'd have a chocolate pudding. Then you put in a, a, a yellow layer on top of that. You could put fruit in between, put it in the refrigerator, and you could make a pudding that is better than any bought instant pudding. Uh, marvelous things you can make with millet. Oats is another wonder food. It's a very good calcium source. It's high in iron, B. It's the second best protein grain. It's a superbly digestible grain. So old people, young people, use these. You can use the oats to make granolas, to make uh, mueslis, to make patties. You put it into everything. It takes the place of an egg any time. You can make waffles with oats, blend it and use it as a, as a waffle uh, base. Wonderful things you can make with oats. We'll come to some recipes in a moment. Rye, for example, is a German grain. And uh, add some rye to your flour just to change things around a little bit. Muesli, rolled oats, chopped nuts, raisins, pumpkin seeds. The pumpkin seed is a seed with an incredibly good protein in it. It's also a complete protein. And just a little bit of pumpkin seeds will provide all your protein needs for a whole day. So if you could start your day with rolled oats and nuts and raisins and seeds and some fruit, shredded coconut maybe, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, and uh, you roast them all together or toast the slightly rolled oats under the grill, stirring frequently and lightly brown, spread the sunflower and sesame and coconut over the top and mix the remaining ingredients and you have a great muesli. If you want to make a granola which is more crunchy, the granolas that you buy in the stores are full of oil. And the oil that they mostly use is sunflower seed oil. And because it's packaged like that, it's oxidized. So it's really not the best thing in the world and it's horrendously expensive. Have you noticed that? You can make it far cheaper and it tastes terrific and you don't need any oil. You can take rolled oats, oats say eight cups of rolled oats, a little bit of sunflower seeds, some coconut if you like, chopped nuts. You can vary that as you like. But this is your binder. Two ripe bananas, one and a half cup chopped dates, a little bit of good salt, hot water. You can use some natural vanilla. And these mixtures over here, you stir the two mixtures together and you mix this in a blender, all in a blender. Then you have this liquid and you mix them all together. And you put them in a cookie sheet and bake them at 250 Fahrenheit. That's a low heat. That's a low heat for about one hour, stirring uh, every half hour. And then it becomes a nice crunchy granola with no oil in it. Tastes terrific. Serve that with soy milk and you've got it made. And it's a lot cheaper if you buy these in a, in a store where they sell seeds cheaply. Rice, try getting used to uh, unrefined rice. It just makes such a difference. Now some people don't like brown rice. They say it's too chewy. The way to get around that is to soak the brown rice overnight like you would soak legumes. And then when you cook it, it gets light and fluffy. That solves the problem. And you don't lose 80% of the B1, 40% of the B2, and 60% of the B3 vitamins as you do with white rice. And uh, start using the rice differently as well. Don't throw the leftovers away. Use them in patties and become innovative. You don't throw anything away. You remodel everything. That's what you do. And you make great things. Wheat. Notice that I've written there, bread, bread, bread. You know, people today are suffering from wheat allergies and gluten allergies and this allergy and that allergy. Have you noticed that? Most of these allergies are secondary 
dairy allergies. Bottom line, if you throw out the dairy, which is making everything else with it incompatible, we always throw out the good and we keep the bad. It's, it's horrendous what we do. Throw out the bad and keep the good. People say to me, for example, oh, I can't eat apples. They make me sick. I said, you eat an apple after you've had a meal with meat and, you know, then you buy, eat an apple and the apple makes you sick. And he says, yes, that's exactly what I do. I said, well, why don't you try throwing out the meat and eating the apple? Oh, no. That's a horrendous thought. So I'd rather have the meat and not eat the apple. Why is the apple fermenting and making you sick when you're eating the meat? Because it's staying in your stomach for six hours. Obviously, it's going to ferment. So throw the apple out. Sorry, throw the meat out. That would be a better solution. So bread, bread, bread. Use the wheat. It's a high energy food. It's an excellent primary nutrient combination. It's mineral rich. It's rich in B and E vitamins. And try not using refined. Try getting whole grains. And if you buy whole wheat grain at your store, remember what you are getting. They have bolted the wheat. They have huge piles of bran. They're selling most of their flour as white flour. And then they have the germ. So normally what they do when they sell you whole wheat flour is they're going to take the white and they're going to mix as much of that bran back in there as they can. And you're buying a pack of 50 or 60 percent bran, 40 percent white flour. That's not what it's like in a grain. You bike a bread that's as heavy as a, as a rock, number one. Nobody wants to eat it because there's not enough white flour mixed in with the bran as it would be with stone ground flour. All kinds of problems with that. Try and get stone ground flour and if you cannot, if it's impossible, then do your own. Even if you have to soak grain and liquidize it and use that as a dough, that would still be better. But when you make your own bread, you can play around. You can add rye. You can add a little bit of millet. You can have all kinds of things. The easiest bread to break is the simplest bread. So here's a simple bread for you. One kilogram stone ground flour. That's about 2.2 pounds or something like that. Stone ground whole wheat flour. Uh, approximately 10 cups. One packet of instant active yeast. It doesn't matter which yeast you're going to use. You're going to destroy the yeast in the heat in any case. And a little bit of good salt. One and a half uh, tablespoons of good salt, not sodium chloride. Then you blend together 900 milliliters of water, and then you can add anything sweet. It doesn't matter what it is. You could add white sugar. It wouldn't make any difference. You know why? Because the yeast is going to utilize it all. It's going to just use it up if you don't put too much in it. But it's also good to use, let's say, fruit. You could use a, a, quarter, a, half, a little bit of raisins. Half a cup would be a little bit much. I would say a quarter cup raisins or a tablespoon raw brown sugar. Or you could use honey. You could use molasses. You could use uh, something sweet like an apple. You could grind it up and, uh, or liquidize it. And that could be your sweetener. So, 900 milliliters of warm water, that's about uh, almost two pints, and then something sweet. Best would be liquidized currants would be the very best because they're very high in iron. And mix that in there and then knead your bread. Knead your bread and knead your bread and let it rise and punch it down and knead your bread and then you mix and develop the gluten so that it's like Chewing gum, you know, like chewing gum. If you then put it in the oven, all the air that is produced by the yeast gets trapped and the bread rises nicely and you bake it in the oven at a relatively high heat to begin with to stabilize the bread. Then you'll have a light, sweet bread. If you do not mix it properly, what's going to happen is the gas is going to produce, the bread will go up, there's not enough chewing gum to trap it, to blow a bubble. So what happens? The bubbles pop and the bread goes and you bake a perfect brick. And you need a chainsaw to cut your slices or you could kill your husband with it if you're angry with him. 
So a simple bread has very few ingredients. Now people actually say, now hang on a second, is that a healthy bread? I actually want everything healthy in my bread. And they put all the things that they can think of in the bread and they bake this heavy bread and they need a wheelbarrow to cart it around. And it's soggy and heavy. You don't have to build a perfect meal into a bread. You eat the meal that's perfect together with the bread. So you eat all the other things with it and make it a balanced meal. So the simpler the bread, the more likely it's going to work. And once you've learned to eat this bread, all other bread tastes like cardboard. I assure you. If I don't get this type of bread, I get with withdrawal symptoms after a while. And that's what a bread should look like. It should be nice and light and fluffy. It shouldn't be heavy and soggy. Nothing wrong with a heavier bread. For example, rye breads will be heavier. But what's nicer than a good bread? Now legumes. We have to start thinking legumes. Carob beans, chickpea, chickpeas, kidney beans, lentils, lima beans, mung beans, broad beans. Peanuts are a legume. Have you ever thought of buying raw peanuts and soaking them like a legume and then making patties out of them? They don't taste like peanuts at all. Only roasted peanuts taste like peanut butter. They taste like a legume, but they taste like a rich, almost lamby, beefy legume uh, when you make a patty out of them. They really are magnificent as a, as a legume. The soya bean, etc. But now you have a problem. People say, I explode when I eat legumes. I cannot handle them. Now, let's understand something about legumes. You have to pre-soak legumes. Raw, dried legumes contain alkaloids, glycosides, saponines, and these are a problem. In fact, they are in the seed to prevent it from germinating. It's an enzyme suppressant. So if you take a legume and you soak it in water, and the legume soaks up all the water, how many of these products have you got rid of? None. They're all still in the legume. Now you take your legume, it's nice and soaked, and you prepare it and you cook it, and all those enzyme suppressants that are prevent the legume from sprouting are still in there. Now you're getting those enzyme suppressants into your stomach, and you're not digesting it too well. Your enzymes are also suppressed. So eventually it goes all the way down, gets to the colon, the colon works with these products and then starts fermenting the legume in the colon and that leads to an explosive experience, <laughs> right? So what you want with a legume is you want to get rid of these things. You want to get rid of them. How do you do that? You soak in huge quantities of water and the water goes what color? Because either reddish brown or one of those, right? That's all the tannins and the saponins and the glycosides and the stuff that's coming out. Now, what do you do with that water? What do you do with it? You throw it away. And not like some well-meaning individual who thinks, well, this looks so good, I'm going to cook the pea soup with that one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you don't need nuclear weapons then. Just send that pea soup. <laughs> It's the most explosive thing under the sun. <laughs> so what I would suggest is that you buy your legumes, soak them in lots of water, pour the water off regularly. If you're sensitive to legumes, do that if it need be for two days, three days regularly. If you don't change the water regularly, they'll go bad. Just keep on pouring off the water and then what do you do? Going to wait three days or two days for a meal? Of course not. You put them into freezer bags and you pop them in the freezer and they're fine. People will say, oh, don't I lose the energy value and the food value? No, you don't. You can take those very seeds and go and plant them and they will grow. What happens in nature, in Europe, in the winter? What happens to those seeds? They freeze in the ground and then when the water comes and it rains and all the stuff leaches out, when the stuff is out, then it can sprout and it will grow. All the nutrients that you need are in there. So soaking is essential for a legume. 
There are lots and lots of different legumes and you can have such fun with legumes. You can make the greatest stews, the greatest soups, the greatest patties. You can make roasts. You can go to town on a legume. But you don't have to have huge quantities of legumes in your meals. That's another problem. We eat too much of it. It must just be a portion of the meal and the rest must be the vegetables or the fruits or whatever else you want to go with it. The soybean is such a magnificent uh, bean. It is rich in linoleic acid. It is good calcium source, iron source, everything that you need. And if you look at the composition of selected soybeans, I'll just put this here for uh, clarity's sake. Beef, for example, look down that list over there and compare with raw or, raw or cooked soybeans, you will see that the soybean compares excellently with anything else. And tofu is a wonderful food. You can make great things with tofu. You can make mayonnaises. A little bit of soft tofu, water, onion salt, garlic salt, or whatever you, you like. Lemon juice, honey, or a little bit of raw sugar to taste. Blend them together, you have a mayonnaise. Now imagine what a mayonnaise normally is made of. What's a mayonnaise made of? Egg yolk upon egg yolk upon egg yolk together with lots of sunflower seed oil, together with lots of vinegar. It's the worst combination under the sun. It's the worst for your cardiovascular system. You cannot imagine worse. Imagine a, a mayonnaise that you make with blended cashew nuts. You take some blended, ca take some cashew nuts, cover them with water, blend them till they're very smooth, add a little bit of uh, your favorite seasoning, and then some lemon juice and voila, you have a mayonnaise that is absolutely marvelous. Now people say, you know, uh, cashew nuts, that's expensive. Hello? How much does a chicken cost in this country? What does a chicken cost? Who can tell me? So let's say four dollars, right? So let's say that chicken weighs what? 1.5 kilos. So let's say it's about three or three dollars um, or let's say two dollars per pound. Is that about right? Is that about right? Two dollars per pound. Good. How much of that chicken is bone? <laughs> At least half of it is bone. So you're not paying two dollars per pound. You're paying four dollars per pound already for your chicken. Now how much of that chicken, once you have deboned it, is water? 70% of it is water. So how much are you paying for your chicken? Well, you go and work it out. You're paying anything up to seven, eight, nine, ten dollars per pound for your, for your chicken. It's a very expensive meal. It looks cheap, but what you're getting is water, 70%. What you're paying for. If you buy cashew nuts, how much of it is food? 100%. So even if you're paying four or five dollars, it's still cheaper than your chicken. So don't tell me cashew nuts are, chick are cheap or expensive. Uh, all right, and you need very little to feed a whole lot. You can make great mayonnaises with tofu. You can make omelets with tofu. You can make, oh, there's so many things. Go to any, any Korean or Chinese person and ask them, what do I do with tofu? And you will be stunned. So go to the various nations that use these foods. Omelets are terrific with tofu. Half a cup of tofu, you can use a little bit of rice flour, add a little bit of cashew, ground nuts, that would be great, liquidized. And then your various condiments, put a little bit something yellow in, and then use a non-stick pan to make an omelet, you can put your favorite filling in there, close it up, and serve it if you really want to be wicked with whatever, with, with fries that you've made with olive oil and a nice salad with it, and it looks and, it looks and tastes just great. And uh, sometimes omelets made with tofu stick a little bit more to the pan than others. So that's no problem. The, the ones that stick and break, they go to the wife, and the good ones come to me. Simple as that. But when I get home now, my wife can have the better ones and I'll take the broken ones. No bake tofu cheesecakes. You can make cheesecakes. You can make the most wonderful things. You can use agar agar as a binder that has no animal products in it. Or you could use MS. 
You get MS in your country, which is a wonderful substitute for gelatin, which is made from horse's hooves and skin scrapings and trotters and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, wonderful uh, things you can make with juices that you blend in. Just ask the fundies how to make these things. You can make waffles. Simple things, soaked soybeans, blend them all together with some rolled oats and you make waffles. Wonderful stuff. They bake a little bit longer. Normal waffle with an egg is finished in a minute. This one takes about five, six, seven, eight minutes to bake through. Now you don't, you don't want to wait that long. So what you do is when you're bored one night and you're not doing anything, they make a mix and start making lots of them. Or the kids are doing something, they're watching television in between, advertisement break, change. Then get all these things done and make a whole pile of them, pop them in the freezer and you have waffles. When you want breakfast with waffles, take your waffles out, pop them in the toaster and voila, you have waffles. You don't have to wait forever. You can make quiches. It's, it's simple. Once you add a little bit of these blended nuts and some lemon juice and all of these things in, you can make wonderful things with these foods and you won't even miss that you're not using eggs. Kidney beans and uh, your own baked beans and Mexican food and you name it. And sprouts. Start using sprouts. Sprouts have enzymes in them. They help you to digest your food. They're wonderful. Mung bean sprouts. Once you get used to them, you'll start craving them. Chickpeas. Chickpeas are wonderful food. Chickpeas is magic. If you have soaked chickpeas, and you blend it and uh, you bring it to a boil, it goes thick by itself. Then you can use it as a sauce. You can even make a mayonnaise out of it by adding lemon juice and a dash of something sweet or tangy, whatever you like. <coughs> and you can make mayonnaises out of chickpeas. You can make hummus out of chickpeas. Who's, who knows hummus? Yeah. All of these things, start thinking about these things and start using carob. Now, carob means you have to re-educate your palate because we're all used to chocolate. And once you have re-educated your palate to carob, which takes a while because we all have perverted palates, then chocolate actually tastes obnoxious. Believe me, I ate whole slabs of chocolate in one go. I cannot stand the taste of chocolate anymore. But carob I can handle, especially if you coat uh, things with it like raisins or coat nuts with it, then it's very handleable and it's very, very pleasant. And a carob drink is a wonderful substitute. Take soy milk, add some carob powder and a little bit of uh, fructose and you bring that, make that hot and serve that. And I'll tell you, the young people just love it and uh, it tastes great. And you can make chocolate sauces, chocolate desserts with carob. Just have to get used to it. Lentils, you can make slices. You can make uh, all kinds of interesting things. Mock liverwurst with it. Some cooked lentils. A little bit of cold oats porridge. Chopped onions. Margarine is what gives it the flavor. If you like a large clove of garlic, some salt, then blend this together and keep the onions just a little bit chewy. In other words, not pureed. And then you have this crunchy liverwurst taste that you can put on bread. You can make savory spreads. And it's the herbs that do it. The basils and the oregano and the tomato pastes which add, add the different flavors. And your nuts and your seeds are your sauces and your creams and your energy booster. So for example, if you're as thin as a rake and you want to put on some weight, then you start using more of these foods. If you are overweight and you want to lose, you use less of these foods. It's as simple as that. You don't have to give up anything, you just use less. And you're only using it as a flavorant. So you can make nut milks, nut sauces, nut creams, nut mayonnaises. And you could use seeds as well. You could make the same thing with sunflower seeds. You could make sunflower mayonnaise, sunflower creams, sunflower sauces. Same things. You can do it with sesames. You can make your own tahinis, uh, your own creams with sesame, sunflower with pumpkin, any one of those. So start looking at nuts differently. Coconut. Coconut contains saturated fat. So 
If you have a problem with weight, a little bit more coconut in the diet, coconut cream, coconut milk, that will make you put on weight. And it is not true that you're going to suffer cardiovascular disease. Because it comes packed with plant protein, it doesn't have that effect. Saturated is not necessarily as bad as animal saturated foods. These Otherwise, all the South Sea Island people would have cardiovascular disease in the past, and they didn't have it. So my wife, for example, she tends to be on the leaner side. So she just adds some coconut cream, and she makes puddings with coconut cream. And me, you know, I tend to battle with this little fellow over here. So I tell her, nyeh, nyeh, less of that for me, thank you. And I don't have that stuff, and she has that stuff. This is how you modulate your weight. It's a very good way of doing it. Nut mayonnaises. Cashews, a half a cup of cashews. You could use sunflower seeds, but the cashew one just tastes pizzazzier. Water, so you could use some fresh garlic if you wanted. You could leave it out. Onion powder, some good salt, lemon juice. And if you want to have a slightly sweet sour, you could lose a little bit of honey or something like that. And it's so simple. You just blend it together until smooth. And then uh, you add the lemon juice and it goes thick by itself. And then you have a mayonnaise. If you take that same sauce and you put it in a saucepan and you bring it to a boil, it makes the creamiest stroganoff sauce that you can imagine. If you have a patty and you put that on top as a butter, it is absolute wickedly good. <laughs> Pimento cream sauce, you make the same sort of thing with the cashews or the sunflowers. And instead of putting cheese on your pizza, when you make one, you pour this over your pizza and you pop it in the oven and you bake it with that. And it's delicious. And once you start getting used to that, cheese actually tastes like rubber after that and you won't want to change. Lasagnas, if you use your noodles and your tomato and your onions and your whatever you want to put in between, and then you put this cashew cream sauce in between your layers and one on top and you bake it with that, the aroma is enough to kill you in a nice way, of course. And you can do, we do this in the field. You know, occasionally, once every 15 years, I get to go out in the field and you take a nice pot and you put this over the coals and the fire and you put a lid on top and you put coals on top and you bake this thing in, in the coals. I'll tell you the people come running and say, what's that? And it tastes terrific. As I said, don't, don't neglect the pumpkin seeds. Throw them into your mueslis, throw them into your breads and uh, don't neglect your sesames. Use the sesame butters and the sesame creams uh, for your bread. Ladies, sesame is one of the richest sources of iron. So it's an excellent source of iron. So try and get used to tahini. If you don't like the taste of tahini, then just take a teaspoon of it and add it to your sauces that you are making, just to give it that pizzazz. And you can make butters and milks and what have you. Fruits and vegetables, remember, variety is the spice of life. And there are lots of, lots of fruits on the market. And most of the world today thinks fruit means bananas and apples. Isn't that right? That's what people buy, bananas and apples. Now, there's nothing wrong with bananas and apples. Bananas and apples are good. By the way, now that I think of apples, people tell me, what about apple cider vinegar? Apple cider vinegar has the good components, some of the phytochemicals of apples in it, which is good for you, but it still has acetic acid in it, which is bad for you. So why not take a little bit of apple juice and add some lemon juice, and then you have apple cider vinegar that is not with uh, acetic acid, but is with uh, citric acid, which is much, much better. So you can start playing around with your, your vinegar sauces. Rather use lemon, and use uh, apple combination to make your sauces like you want them. There are melons and olives and papayas and all of these things. So when you start thinking fruit, start thinking like this. Then you get peckish. Doesn't that look great? And even if you preserve them, they're still better than nothing. 
Preserved fruit is better than no fruit. And when you start thinking vegetables, again, think variety, think cauliflower, bro broccoli, Brussels sprouts, think dark green things. And you know what? If you don't like them, start changing them. If you don't like spinach, well, many people, if you get a cooked let spinach leaf on your plate, that might not be so appetizing. How about sauteing some onions, chopping the spinach, and putting them together and then adding a little bit of cashew nut cream and making a creamy, delicious spinach that really tastes like something and has some zuma in it. Get a little bit of pizzazz into your cooking. So everything doesn't have to be bland on your, on your plate. It can be wonderful. And start becoming innovative. Start thinking what to do with the leeks and the garlics and the onions. And remember, these are your top 10 fruits in the world in terms of the antioxidant power that they have in them. Strawberries, you live in a strawberry country. And uh, plums are very good, oranges, red grapes, kiwi, grapefruit, white grapes, banana, apple, tomato. And gentlemen, remember, the tomato is an anti-prostate cancer fighting food. So start using tomatoes, lots of them, and uh, get used to them. And the antioxidant vegetables, I wouldn't put corn on that list because that to me is a grain, but nevertheless, leave it there. Kale is very good, spinach, Brussels sprouts, alpha, broccoli, beets, red bell peppers, onions. I would put uh, cabbage in there as well as one of the best antioxidant foods. So the cabbage family in general, Kale, of course, is part of the cabbage family, and wow, that's a power food in terms of, of uh, iron and in terms of calcium. Wonderful food. So start using these things. Food sources that fight uh, cancer. Brussels sprouts has synegrin, broccoli has sulforaphane and other components as well. The red grapes has resveratrol, citrus has limoline. So if you have a variety of foods, you get a variety of anti-cancer agents. If you only have one food in your diet, you'll only have one anti-cancer agent. So why not fight on all fronts if you can? So remember your high anti-cancer foods are garlic, cabbage, licorice, soybeans, ginger, carrots, celery, parsnips, and then your, your grains generally, and your tomatoes, your eggplants, your peppers, Put these foods into your diet and fight cancer. Now, I've written a book on this. Unfortunately, this book is published by CRC Press and Medfarm, which is not unfortunate in terms of the science thereof, because those are the best scientific publishers in the world. But that means that this book goes out to the medical world. That was my target, to try and reach those that can affect most of the people lower down. So if you want to buy this book, it's horrendously expensive. I would not be able to afford this book. So the, that's the sad part about this book, that it's very expensive because of that. And uh, you don't actually need the book because it has a lot of science in it. If you're interested in that, that's good. There are lots of recipes in that. But there are so many recipe books out there in the world. And there are so many books that put this simply and, but you don't want to get one that makes life complicated for you. You want simple, straightforward recipes that tell you how to prepare food in a tasty, wholesome way without 10 million rules to drive you nuts. That's what you basically need. And if you take some of the ideas that we've spoken about today and you go to those who've had some experience in this and start getting involved in cooking schools or uh, I hear that you have chip programs and things in this country where you might get some wonderful ideas, then get involved slowly. And as, as the bug bites you, it will be fun. And once it starts being fun and once it starts tasting good, you will feel better, you'll be excited, you'll have more energy, and you can be an example to others. Don't make a religion out of your diet. There's nothing worse than putting diet before religion. God comes first, food comes second. Food is there to be enjoyed. But why not enjoy it and be healthy at the same time? Thank you. And you can be a light unto others and you can help them 
to a healthier lifestyle. Just this message alone. We get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. I was lecturing in Germany once, in Germany. And there was an old lady sitting in the back in my lectures. It was in a big hall. There were over 800 people in the hall. And uh, she was in a wheelchair. And she was in an old age home and she had terrible arthritis. Her fingers were like that. And she was, I don't know exactly how old it was. I speak under correction, but I think she was in her 80s. So a very old lady. And I happened to return to the same town four years later. Four years later. And I was finished lecturing, and you know, like always, you're tired because you're doing all these lectures and you have hundreds of people. And if there are 800, well, then there are 800 more questions than normal. And you know, the people were asking and asking. And suddenly, this little old lady came and she put her arms around me. And here she stood. She was only about yay high. And she was very old, and her fingers were still skew. And uh, she said to me, You know, four years ago, you were here. And I was in the old age home. So arthritic, I couldn't move my fingers, and I was just waiting to die. And uh, now I stand next to you. I've left the old age home. I've gone back to my apartment. I can do my own work again. I even do my own gardening again. And maybe I'll end up in the old age home again one day, but for the moment, I'm happy that I can be at home. I implemented what you said, and I could get up out of my wheelchair. That makes a difference. And I don't care about all the critics then. That's what makes it worthwhile. And people that had been given up for dead with cancer, that they'd operated, closed up, sent home to die, changed their lifestyles and their tumors went back and back and back. Not everybody, some die, but some that actually stick to it start getting better. And we've got just piles and piles of letters and it just makes sense to tell people how God, if you think how God had, had put everything together there in the beginning, he tells us what the original diet was. Obviously, if we're going to give the body what it was designed for, it's going to be the best. Who does not want you to be healthy? The devil doesn't want you to be healthy. And what does he use to make you unhealthy? He uses human ambition and love of money and uh, industry to put foods together that make money and quick money and, and make you captive so that you can become ill. And the natural foods, they just go. God wants us to go as natural as possible. I'm sure that's what he wants to do. But he wants to reach the heart and the soul as well. So do not put the cart before the horse. It's not food that makes religion. It's religion that makes food. And so that is the invitation. Be a light, help others, and then the great truths of the Bible. Wow, just look at them. They're so magnificent. What can be more logical than a world that obeys God? Can anything be more logical than that? What is stupid about that? What is more logical than believing that Jesus Christ is the, is the creator and the savior? The whole Bible says it, and if people were to adhere to his commandments, wow. That would just make this world a wonderful place. And in the future world, it will be a wonderful place because there will be no more sin in all this holy mountain and people will again keep the law of God. So why not keep it now? Why not set an example? And if we slip and slide and fail and have human failings, we have an advocate with the Father who any time says, come to me and I will heal you of all your maladies not propagating any form of perfectionism or fanaticism or any one of those things. It's a logical religion. And that is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. So God bless you as you go your ways and we go back to our ways. And I'll always carry you in my hearts and thank you for listening. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a time we've spent together. We've had so many discussions and so many slides pass before our eyes. But the bottom line, Lord, is that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And all the slides, if there's one idea that has come up, and that is that it's not worth it to have our kingdom on earth, but that we should long for our kingdom with our Heavenly Father. If that thought is paramount in our minds, then we will have achieved something in this place called Baton Rouge. And Lord, if a little light has been kindled and lights in general have been kindled, let them not die. 
but let them turn into a raging fire that will consume not only this city but all the surrounding ones and eventually even the whole world so that the, lo the world may be lightened with your glory. And the Lord Jesus, I commit everyone here to your care as only you care, one who has given his life for those who are just sinners, surely you will take care of everyone that is here. I pray for your blessing upon them, your watch care, your angels to guide their paths, their decisions, and their life as it proceeds from now on. And may we have the privilege, Lord, of one day, everyone represented here, standing with you on the sea of glass as we go to the heavenly Jerusalem. And may we one day in the earth made new, ponder the little time that we spent here together and say, Lord, it was worth it after all. Your blessing is what we need, for without it we perish. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.